Great. Um, already. Are we on? Am I on? You're on. Where am I? Oh, there I am. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna uh, date it, and then we'll um, we'll get going. So this is Jeff Katz, and it is Thursday, September third, two thousand and nine. It's approximately one one fifty <coughs> p.m., and we are here with Ray Tufts at her home in Mount Baker. So um, and Sweetie Pie is with us. <laughs> so um, I'll have a few questions for Sweetie Pie at the end. But first, we'll talk to Ray. And um, what I'm, we're going to do initially is just some general background questions, and then we'll start talking about Allied Arts and, uh, and some of the work you've done outside of Allied Arts, which is substantial. So, um, first question, and, and I know that one part of the question you'll be fine with, the second part of the question you might, you might not be so fine with, but I'm just wondering if you could share with us uh, where you were born and what your date of birth was. First part of the question is fine, the second part, no. The first, I was born in Deadwood, it's a rule of thumb, Deadwood, South Dakota. And then I left from there and I lived in Two Dot, Montana. How's that? <laughs> Not too many people can probably say that. Probably no one but me. <laughs> And can you uh, tell us a little bit about your family, your parents? Yes. Um, my mother died when she was uh, 40. And she was very beautiful. And she was a lot of fun. Uh, my father was very handsome. And he, did, he died when he was 50. Um, they, and he was an engineer, but fell on hard times because of, in the 40s, the depression sort of hit them. So we were very, very poor. And um, when I was growing up, uh, I know this will sound funny, but I never had a room of my own. I slept on the couch and, um, and was none the worse for it. So I was an only child, so I didn't have to share the couch. <sighs> when did you move from South Dakota to Montana? Oh, I have no idea, like when I was three or oh. two or three or something like that. And then I graduated from high school in Montana. And, um, and went to Colorado for college, and then I came back to Montana and took a degree at the University of Montana. What did you study um, in college in your, your first, first degree? History. History. English history. And then uh, when I came here, I took, do you want degrees and things? I took um, a degree in English um, and a master's in English uh, at the University of Washington. And then I took a master's in um, urban design in the College of Architecture at the University of Washington. So. Do you remember uh, what year it was that you graduated? What, you, what year you graduated? From the. From uh, first from Montana and then from no, the University of Washington. No, because it wasn't the year I left. I went. I wrote back to get a degree, so the degree. I think the degree says 65, but I actually had it before that. My um, degree, my last degree I can remember, that was at the College of Architecture and Urban Planning. And that was um, 1970, 1970. Now you have an honorary degree as well, is that correct? Not quite. What I have I was elected a fellow of Harvard in design and so they give you this thing that you're a fellow I mean you're always a fellow and um, and it was wonderful I mean not only did I get to say I'd been a fellow of Harvard but they paid my way there for a year and I lived at Harvard and I didn't have to do anything except hang out with all these interesting people and walk around. I actually wrote quite a bit, but I didn't have to. 
Fred Bassetti was one of the people who nominated me. And I just loved him for it because he had gone to the GSD, the Graduate School of Design. And um, so he got me into there. And that was wonderful. One of the best things ever happened to me. So. What year was that that you, were, that you did that fellowship? 85, 1985. I was there for 84, 85, the school year, you know, from 84 through 85. I was there for the whole year. Okay, I that question. <laughs> Is that going to bother you? That? Mm -hmm. Go out and tell them to stop. It's really loud. Oh, <laughs> I'll go out and tell them to stop. I'm sorry. I mean, I had no idea it was coming. This happened every okay. interview. Every interview we've, we've, we've had an interruption. Okay, well, you know how to do it then. Planes go by, you know, things that are out of your hands. That's right. Okay, we're ready. Okay, great. Um, so, that was 1985 that, that you were... Yes, at Harvard. <laughs> well, that's quite exciting. That's quite exciting. So, you, you first came to Seattle, and do you remember that year when you first came here? I don't, exactly. I'm sorry, I don't. And, and, but you came here to go to, to, go to school. Mm -hmm. And what brought you to the University of Washington? Why did you choose Washington? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. I'd rather not <laughs> move right along. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, um, before you became involved with Allied Arts, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that at great length soon, um, what were you uh, involved in before you became a member of Allied Arts? Um, earning a living, going to school, earning a living. I was married at the time, had a huge house, was sort of keeping that up, entertaining, doing that sort of stuff. And then, um, and also, I was a painter. So I was doing a lot of my own painting, and I had some shows. So, long time ago. Where were you, where were you living at that point? In the Madrona district. And then I sold my house and moved to Denny Blaine. And I lived in a coach house in Denny Blaine, which was very nice. And what was your, uh, what, what was your, what was your husband's occupation? Well, I've had more than one husband, so we'll just move along. That's fine. That's fine. They were all academics. She's laughing. So, um, when exactly did you begin your involvement with Allied Arts, and what attracted you to the organization at that time? Oh, all my friends were on the board. And they called me and said, we want you to be on the board of Allied Arts. And I thought that just sounded like a zippy thing to do. So, um, and I think it was Mary Coney was the person that first contacted me. She and I have been longtime friends, you know, from the English department graduate school. And, um, um, and I think that must have been in, um, oh, probably... 72, something like that, around that time. And so then I was invited to be on the board. It was all very casual, and, um, but I can, re I can remember Mary calling me and saying, uh, we'd like to have you be on the board of Allied Arts, and I thought, hmm, well, that sounds like fun. And so it was, lots of fun. What did you know about Allied Arts at that point when you became a board member? Uh, very little, but uh, that all my friends liked Allied Arts, and I knew that they gave great parties, and it sounded good to me. Later on, I was began to realize how substantial an influence they were having, had had, and were and continuing to have. So it was a good time. So you actually met Mary when you were going to school. Oh yes, yes. And that must have been, so you must have come around 72, you said, around that time and became a board member. Yes. Yeah, I think I was a board member. I think it was around 72, something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you came to Allied Arts, um, I'm wondering if you could share with us a sense of what Allied Arts 
was looked how how allied arts was looked upon by people in the city and by the city council and the mayor of the city. What what was the general climate as far as allied arts was when I came on the board? Yeah. Um, I really can't say. I wasn't really that much interested in. I mean, I later became interested and worked for government and became very much involved in politics and government. But at that time, I was working. Um, I knew that Allied Arts was involved in things that I came to care about, you know, like the market and whatever. But I, the, the depth and breadth of their influence was yet to be revealed to me. And what were you doing at the time? What was your what was your job at the time that you joined Allied Arts in seventy two? Um, probably going to school. I had perpetual scholarships and fellowships, and I think I was still going to school, or maybe I was teaching part time. Yes, I was. I was going to finishing, but I was teaching part time at uh, Seattle Community College. And then I was offered a temporary position at the university, and then I went to there, and then I taught at the university off and on for about 18 years. What were you, t what were you teaching exactly? Urban design, um, College of Architecture, architectural history, uh, history of civilizations, built, the built environment, um, policy, um, my favorite course was public art and how do you present public art. And it's a course I designed and I got to teach it several times. So that was fun. And very much connected to what I learned. Oh yeah, about. absolutely. That was the genesis of the whole thing, really. Because there was a lot of, uh, we by that time had gotten the 1% for art passed. And so, um, there was money to be spent on art. The question was, who picks? Who gets to be in? So I made it into a course uh, for planners, which was fun, loads of fun. Did you have anybody from the organization come and do like guest lectures or guest, guest uh, speakers? Probably, probably. Um, but I don't remember who. I mean, there was such a cornucopia of people who do, would come to speak, you know, many, many people. Was, was uh, Norm Johnston, uh, were you in contact with him? Oh, he was my mentor. He was my mentor. Um, I took several classes from Norm, the history of the city and whatever. And then when Norm um, would be on sabbatical, he kind of appointed me to teach his courses, which was really nice. And then when he retired, I, I taught them. So, yes, he is um, a very important person in my life. He was mentioning when we, when we spoke to him that he was, he was much more comfortable, or he was much more, he enjoyed um, doing history of architecture and design much more than the actual Design and hands-on, hands on. yes, yeah. and and he he was really a wonderful teacher. Um, he was stern, well organized, um, much information, and just wonderful lectures. I thought, I thought. Now, with the, at the time that you came to Allied Arts. Um, Around 72, Fred Bassetti was just ending his presidency, and um, and Paul Schell was beginning his presidency. I don't recall that Fred was was still president when I came there. I, it was Paul Schell was president when I came, so that may, might pinpoint the year a little more accurately. Fred had danced off into the wings by that time, although he was never in the wings. He was always important. But Paul Schell was the president who welcomed me. Now could you, could you talk a little bit about, um, even though you didn't have the direct experience with him at Allied Arts, could you talk a little bit about Fred and, and maybe some of the things that you know about that he accomplished or some, your, your 
relationship with him. How long have you got? Have you got two months, three months, you know? Maybe a, maybe a condensed version. <laughs> I didn't really uh, have much to do with Fred in the context of Allied Arts. I mean, he was there and he always said interesting things. But I used his buildings as points for my lectures. Um, he is an incredibly important architect, I believe. And he was the one that was doing tall buildings, big buildings. He did residential work also. Um, he was always, in terms of Allied Arts, really a little uh, before my time. But he was always generous, you know, to donating things and coming and wonderful to talk to and give lectures and things like that. So when I was teaching, he would come and give lectures and that was just wonderful. Um, subsequently, um, I don't think I told you, I was also the architecture and design critic for the Seattle Times for 16 plus years. And uh, some of the articles I wrote were on Fred's buildings. And usually he liked what I said and one or two times he didn't and he let me know about it. And that was kind of fun. Uh, Fred's influence in Seattle is um, is profound architecturally. Well, probably more than architecturally, aesthetically. Are there other people that, that you would uh, that you would care to mention who you think had that same kind of effect or similar effect architecturally? Oh, uh, certainly Ralph Anderson. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think Arnie Bystrom, Arnie Bystrom, uh, although he didn't do big buildings, or but no, he's a remarkably good architect. Um, I was trying to think of someone else. I mean, there are, there are many. Gordon Walker, for example. Um, I'm drawing a blank, but you know all this anyway, I think. It's great to hear it from you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what about Ibsen Nelson? Is, is, uh, is he, are you familiar with, with I knew Ibsen, yes. And I didn't really know much of his work. I know Fred thought he was a remarkably good architect. And I've seen some things of Ibsen's. Um, I'm, I think he was. I'm just not as familiar with his work as... Um, I am with Fred's or Victor's or others that I knew. Ralph Anderson, you mentioned some uh, some of the the the, uh, and the the people that we've we've been talking to have mentioned that they thought Ralph Anderson deserved a lot of credit that he hasn't gotten for the Pike Place Market and just. I think in, that's in true. General. I think that's true. Um, and I can remember one time uh, having lunch at the Pike Place Market. Was Fred, and we were wandering around, you know, and he was pointing out, now Ralph was the person who did this and thought about this and so on and so forth. So and that was very illuminating to me. Fred was very, yeah, he was very. Um, he had some really nice things to say about Ralph Anderson, and he said them to me too. Actually, the one thing I know about Ralph Anderson was a house that he designed um, for Phyllis Lamphere. And it was on the side of a hill on West, on West Seattle a long time ago. So, um, but I've looked at some of Anderson's things and yes, he was a, a remarkable architect, I think, but he didn't quite get into the public domain in quite the same way as others. I'm wondering if you could if you could talk a little bit about um, that early period when you when you came to the organization and um, that first of all the percent for the arts um, legislation and that whole campaign and also the leadership of Paul Shell at that point. Um, sure, I think. Um 
one of the things um, that I have always thought, there have been a lot of presidents of Allied Arts and in some, you know, before my time, Fred, Norm, etc., etc., way before my time. Um, some were sort of placeholders, some did nothing, and then some were quite extraordinary. I would put Paul in that class. Uh, he was a really good president. The other person that was a really good president that's kind of dot I th in my in my mind was Paul Silver. He was a very good president, you know, kept things going along, adhering to an ad <laughs> Did it blow? A good cleaner. She cleans pretty well, huh? <laughs> she cleans up pretty well. Except I should brush her more, and um, I don't enough. Good. And then every now and then there's a, oh, she's dying. She's dying. No, she's dying. She's That's a hairball. <laughs> big gloppy thing. But she's learned that she does it on the wood floor and not on oh, the really? white carpet or so, the oriental rugs. Well. That's good. She takes her fur balls to the, uh, to the wood. That's nice. <laughs> it can get messy. Jeff, when we talk... Yeah. I am early. Okay, good. So we're all... Okay. Light is fine. Yes, we're good. <laughs> okay. So we were, we were discussing um, that early period when you came to Allied Arts and, and Paul Schell... Oh, I and, didn't put her mic back on. Oh. They are upset this time. Okay. All right, so um, so we were talking about your first you know first couple of years at Allied Arts and, and Paul Schell's leadership, and you before we get back to Paul Schell, you mentioned Paul Silver, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on Paul Silver a bit. Oh, um, he came a little bit later, two or three or four presidents later, and um, I think what was so uh, he was very even. And he, he's an attorney and a very good attorney. And he's had the knowledge of where he thought things should go. He was on top of everything. And he just, the meetings ran very smoothly. I thought Paul was, both Pauls were good presidents. And there have been others that were, that were good. But I just think, in my mind, they stand out. Margaret Pageler was a very good president, I thought, too. And Mary was a good president. But, um, but both Pauls, I think it was because they were attorneys, which is not necessarily because we've had a couple of attorneys that weren't quite so good. Jerry Thone was not a president when I was there, and neither was, well, whatever. My brain is getting tired of thinking about Allied Arts Prison. So, what else? We will actually come back to Mary and, and Margaret later on. But um, right now, we can take it back to, to the Paul Shell years and to the percent for the arts legislation. And I'm wondering if you can recall some of, some of that, the, the percent for the arts legislation, and what was happening with that. I don't know when it passed, but I can remember testifying at city council, which then became difficult for me f because I had a moderately substantial job at the city of Seattle. And so I had to tread very lightly not to have a conflict of interest. Uh, fortunately, my then boss was pretty easy about things. And then the person who replaced him was just wonderful and he would just say okay you can do anything you want just don't get us in trouble and you can't be president it's okay with me so that's I was never president of Allied Arts I was the longest running first vice president I think I was first vice president something like eight terms or something like that and in one case, um, the person who was president really didn't hardly ever showed up. So basically, I was the president because I ran every meeting that year. Fun stuff. Uh, what, what, uh, um, what else 
can you say about the, the, those um, Paul, Paul Shaw's leadership and um, and that legislation itself, if if uh, you can recall the impact that it had or the the excitement that it created um, in the arts community. Well, I really can't, Jeff. Um, I can uh, speak to. I mean, it was a wonderful thing to do, and there was a lot of controversy about it. And then it passed, and then it was wonderful. But later on, as a person who administered it, since I had a position in which I dealt with project management and I did all that, I, there were parts where I think, oh, this is a real pain in the neck. You know, I mean, I loved it, but, and that gave me an opportunity to work with. Um, the Seattle Arts Commission, since I was the person in the Park Department who mostly did the 1% for art. And so I had a very um, uh, st strong relationship with the people who were doing 1% for art in the Seattle Arts Commission. Among them, my neighbor and very close friend, Barbara Earl Thomas, who lives across the street and who is a distinguished artist and um, a totally wonderful person. She's now the director of the African American Museum. But that was how I met Barbara Earl Thomas. In the Seattle Arts Commission? Yes, she was doing 1% for art. And then there was Lynn Cartagainer, uh, who's um, now retired and lives someplace else. So I had a lot of fun with it, but it also, um, we always had to explain to the Board of Park Commissioners why we were uh, funding or proposing those rocks in the park, the Michael Heiser adjacent against a pond. And then it was always the controversy. Why are we putting money into these rocks in the park when we need housing? low-income housing, that's always the argument. And of course, that's apples and oranges. It, you know, if we didn't spend money on art, it didn't mean we are going to spend it on housing. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So, those are fun times. And, and now, during Mary's, uh, actually right before Mary's presidency, she was involved with um, increasing the funding for the Seattle Arts Commission. And uh, She was. Um, the thing that Mary and I uh, worked together on quite a bit was the um, uh, not chopping down trees. Uh, I can't remember what the ordinance was called. Uh, oh, I still can. Um, the street trees ordinance? Yeah. And that sort of, as I recall, got its uh, genesis with the city coming out and cutting down trees in Mary's hallowed wonderful historic neighborhood and so on and so forth and um, so anyway and Mary with her wonderful pro sense of purpose you know sort of got that passed where much to the concern of lots of people particularly the guy that owned the Five Point Cafe and um, he had cut down some trees and we got on his case and it was Anyway, that was that was a good piece of legislation, and it's still hanging around. I love her. I know. You're molesting my cat. I am. <laughs> She's asking for it. Um, now, when, when, when you uh, first started with Allied Arts, um, you were involved in a couple of committees right away. One of them was called the Urban Environment Committee. And then there was a short-lived Arboretum Committee that, um, that Paul Schell tried to resurrect yes. in 1973. Well, the Urban Environment was because I was teaching in uh, you know, urban design and urban planning and blah, blah, blah. And the last thing in the world I wanted to work on was that. I mean, that was my day job. This was a, a fun thing. And the Arboretum was just, I mean, I said, I can't be on that and you can't do it either because it was a tremendous period of, of um, litigation and controversy about the Arboretum and the tripartite ownership and I was right in the middle of it all and I couldn't say word one about it and so that was, um, it's just, hold that thought. 
Are you turning this off? Well, I don't want the phone ringing in the background. So I don't either. Don't, if you don't want to answer it. I don't want to answer it. Why would I want to answer it? Um, did you turn it off? Mm-mm. Huh? I mean, am I still on tape? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. All right. There's no reason to turn it off for like two seconds or something. Okay. Um, so there was no way that we could have an Arboretum Committee because the university was involved, the city was involved, state government was involved. Oh, God, go away. Um, sorry about that. Um, Stop. I'm not answering. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. So the Arboretum. Yeah, so there was, and, and there really wasn't anything that Allied Arts could do or should do. I mean, they should keep out of it at that point. And I think that was what, the, what we finally came to. I don't think there was an Arboretum Committee. <laughs> well, Maybe it's an emergency. Well, should we wait? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Awful as I am about all this, I mean, with everyone's phone rings. Yeah, everyone. 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 But see, I could have turned it off. No one else has. Yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> it has to happen. Yeah, so. it's required. That's the, it. Only happens to prove that we're still popular or something <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay, but I can vouch there was somebody on the other end. So. Yes, there was, absolutely. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, um, so, yeah, the Arboretum, now the, but you did report back to Allied Arts about the Arboretum, what was happening with the Arboretum. I did, but, but with, uh, with uh, a lot of prudence. I really walked a very thin line, and it was only because my boss, who was Walter Hundley, an absolutely fantastic guy, was so accommodating that I was allowed to do what I did and still do what I did with Allied Arts. So, it was fun. There was another gentleman uh, who resigned from the Arboretum Committee at the same time you did, named James Wilson. Um, do, you, do you recall who, who that was? Oh yeah, he was the Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General for the University. and. Um, he had been in Allied Arts, but the minute that, that Allied Arts started getting into university business, he had tremendous conflicts of interest, so he resigned. Ta-ta. Allied Arts was involved, was, had, their, had their tentacles everywhere. Everything, everything, everything. But I think you're missing the kind of the quintessential wonderfulness and so I will quote Peggy Goldberg, who said, it's the best club in town. And I think that's what we all loved about it, that we could be doing good things, hopefully that we were doing good things, and kicking up a little storm and feeling that we were uh, participating, participatory democracy, and at the same time, just having a swell time, drinking wine and eating cheese, and it was wonderful fun. Best club in town, quote Peggy Goldberg, who knows about good, good clubs. <laughs> Lots of interesting people involved. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, very much so. It seems like everybody seems to have that, that opinion that it was, uh, it was uh, just a a fun, a fun experience for them. It was, and in retrospect, I look back at it because subsequently I've been on several boards and foundations, and none of them were as much fun as Allied Arts when Allied Arts was, you know, in the in these prime years in the mid '70s to mid '90s, or maybe just to the mid end of the '80s. Yeah, because I'm, I think. It, one time I've been on five or six different boards and or foundations and, and, some, and doing good works and things that I was interested in, but none of them were this much fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that means a lot. Oh, yeah, it did. Now, one of the things that, that happened while you were 
there in those early years was that the Pike, Pike Place Market uh, preservation Authority. finally took place. Yes, it did. The, the but the groundwork had been laid before my time. And I think that all that I was involved in was sort of the closure, um, you know, getting people out to vote. When, when did that vote take place? I think it was 73. Yeah, that, I, as I recall, knocking on doors and putting signs out um, because um, not here at my other at the, when I lived at the coach house and doing things like that, but um, I didn't. I wasn't a, a seminal figure in all of that. So. But you recall that that. that oh, it was thrilling. Thrilling. There were some. Uh, there were some other preservation efforts that, that took place during during those those years, and one was the Olympic Hotel. Another was Lake Union. Um, are those a couple of things that you might want to talk a little bit about? I really know, don't know that much about them. I wasn't involved in any of them. What about the billboard legislation? Well, I wasn't involved in it, except that of supporting it and maybe helping to draft it or some, you know, a little bit of that, but um, it didn't need, I mean, I, I wasn't for whatever reason. I mean, it was great to do it, but. Now, um, we, we talked a little bit about Mary Coney's presidency. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit more about it because she was the first female president of Allied Arts, and i um, just wondering if you have some observations about, um, first of all, about her becoming the first female president, and, and then just about her years as president. Well, she was great. I didn't, I never thought that it was that big a deal, um, although it was, really, because it had been, uh, I suppose, I never thought of it as a male bastion, and Mary had earned it, and everyone supported her. There was um, a couple of people who were concerned that, that she wouldn't be um, approved at the annual meeting, and that was just nonsense. I mean, it was resounding. Everyone unanimously approved her, and, and she was fine. She was just great, wonderful, fun to work with. How did, how did uh, people become nominated for president in general? What was the procedure? Well, there would be a nominating committee that would be appointed by the president, and that the nominating committee would then present a slate uh, to the membership. And um, I think, no, the nominating committee would present a slate to the executive board. And then the executive board, I believe this is the way it worked, would present it to the membership, and it was yay or nay, and it was always accepted. There were very few um, controversies, some, but um, not too many. It was pretty much, the nominating committee pretty much knew. Yeah, I'm, I mean, people, I, there was this old saying, like, you work your way through the chairs, you know, and that was kind of what happened. I think. I started out as a secretary, and then I moved to second vice president. I think there was an interim something. Anyway, then I became first vice president, and every year they would say, "Could you, could you be president this year?" No, I can't. Okay, so I was first vice president longer than anyone else was president or vice president or whatever. It's funny. So, actually, um, so you, you were uh, first vice president and then second vice president. The, those first years were, I think, 1981 to 1983 when you first became first vice president and second vice president. And um, you served with, I guess, I think it was uh, Camille McLean was the president <coughs> and mm -hmm. Henry Aronson then was the president in those three years. Um, I think Margaret was too. A little bit, a little bit later. I well, think. you tell me. Yeah, she was a little bit later. It seemed to me that there was someone else that I, that was president when I was being the first vice president too, but I cannot remember who it was. And you've got all of that in front of you, so you tell me. 
the list of presidents, um, I think I don't, I don't have... It, does, it, does it matter? No. <laughs> I was just a perpetual first vice president. Okay. Um, there are a couple of, while well, we're, well, we're talking about Mary Coney and, a couple of, and, the, and the fact that she was the first female president, there were a couple of other, obviously a few other, very strong female leaders of allied arts, and two of them were Peggy Goldberg and Alice Rooney. And I'm just wondering if you could, since we've talked to Peggy and Alice, um, and everybody points to Peggy and Alice as being the two, two of the, you know, the real strong foundations of allied arts, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Peggy and Alice. Well, I don't think that I could add anything that anyone else hasn't said. I adored them both. I looked up to both of them. I didn't know Peggy that well, but I came to know Alice very well. And over the years, we became very close friends, you know, having lunch together and having dinner together. And, and uh, she was very um, helpful when I became an officer and telling me what to do and, you know, what I should do and not. So I don't think I could probably add anything to what Fred or Jerry or Mary, oh, well, and Mary will say. Um, but they're just, they're just wonderful, both of them. Differently wonderful. Differently wonderful. And, and was that the, was the feeling at that point when you joined also that, that, that they were really the, uh, they were two of the, the real strong people at Allied Arts? Well, yeah. Yeah. Now, what happened uh, when Alice left? I guess she left in 1980. Um, she she um, resigned from Allied Arts and went to Pilchuck. Um, what was, what was, was that 1980? I thought it was later than that. Yeah, 19, 1980. 1980. Well, she went to Pilchuck and, and that was a good move for her and then not a good move for her, as I recall, but I don't want to speak to that. She and I just kept having lunch together, you know, so it was just, and she was always a great supporter. Mm -hmm. How were things at Allied Arts when that happened? I have no idea. You think I could? I can't remember. I can't remember that. Sorry to say. That's okay. That's okay. We can, um, we can actually, what I'd like to also get your take on is um, two other really strong female leaders of Allied Arts, Camille McLean and Margaret Pageler at this point. So I'm wondering if you could, we haven't talked about either one with anybody else. Um, if you have any thoughts about the two of them or, or one of them. Either Margaret or Camille. Well, um, Margaret and um, Camille is, is a good friend, and um, she had different goals than um, she was. She was a strong president, but uh, her goals didn't quite, in my opinion, didn't quite match with others. Margaret was a very good president, and kind of cut and dry, I mean, not cut and dry, that's, but rigorous. I mean, and um, and she's an attorney, and so she knew how to lay things out and so on and so forth, so. It's interesting how, how over the years, so many people from Allied Arts wound up getting involved in city government. In the early years, it wasn't so much, but as it, as it went on, it seemed like more and more people. Yeah, I think that's true. Right. That was one thing that Fred had mentioned was that that um, you know he thought that it was great that Paul Shell was able to do that and uh, you know and and take his activism um, to a, a different level. So. I think so too. Yeah. Now there are some other some some really um, memorable projects that happened during the '70s, which was you know this this very great period of activity. I'm going to toss a couple out and see if you have any any recollections of these. One is the uh, the Art Deco uh, program that happened in uh, the late '70s. No, oh, no, I wasn't involved in it. And there's also a Crafts Week program. That the what? Crafts Week. No, I wasn't involved in that either. Any any um, uh, memories of the no. uh, nothing at all? <laughs> what about the uh, not interested? <laughs> what about the survival series that uh, that happened during Paul Shell's years? It was uh, where small small arts groups and small performing groups were um, were featured. 
Well, I really just don't remember that. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, one thing that you that you might have some recollection of is the downtown plan that Allied Arts was uh, was very supportive of. Yes. And um, that's something that we haven't really discussed a lot with with some of the people we've talked to. I'm wondering if you have some uh, some recollections, some thoughts about that. I do. Uh, I was not particularly in favor of making that our sole agenda item for the whole year because that's what I did for a living and I knew that this would just be a citizen input and it would be okay but I was more interested in doing other things with Allied Arts and that was just me so Allied Arts was involved and did but I and I'm and I'm trying to think whether had a significant um, impact and I'm sure it did but I just can't remember I was not very much interested in doing in an organization what I did for money during the day so I mean I wanted to get a kind of way from it I know that sounds odd but um, I was involved in it a little bit but not with my heart so, could you explain a little bit what the downtown plan was? No, I can't. No. Just move on, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Well, well, one thing that, but that's a little bit more more fun probably to talk about um, is are the Allied Arts annual meetings, which which you chaired often. And yes, <laughs> well, they were parties. That's what made them fun. That's why I like to do them. What were those? What was, are there some that stand out, or some that? Uh, well, they all stood out. I mean, um, sometimes we'd have them at people's houses, and um, one of them I just came up, Allied Arts gets its just desserts, and we just had desserts. And then that turned out to be that people just got a huge sugar overload, so then, you know, we got a, a few other little things, but they were fun. They were just great social events. and. Um, and that would be when the slate of officers would be presented and the board would vote on it. And there was, I wouldn't say a substantial amount of alcohol consumed, but let's say there was alcohol consumed. Everybody was quite happy. How uh, long did it take you to plan those meetings? Not very long. Yeah. Not very long. I mean, I continued doing that sort of thing with two other boards that I was on, you know, where I would be the chair. But those were really, because it would be the major fundraisers, and I, I did that. But, um, no, they they were just fun, you know. And when did they usually take place, and what time of year? Well, probably, um, I want to say the late spring, because it would be the end of the term. I mean, the end of the um, people's, um, the end of their term for their, whatever. I don't remember. Late spring. Mm -hmm. It's good enough for government. <laughs> not, at, not at in December, because that'd be Christmas. Not in November, that would be Thanksgiving, blah, blah, blah. Not around Easter. Let's just say May. <laughs> well, that sounds good. <laughs> now there was there was a um, a point, you know, in the in the questionnaire that that you filled out so um, so generously. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody filled their questionnaires out. Um, I had to take I had to take a little nudging. <laughs> you you mentioned that um, that there was kind of a shift in Allied Arts uh, around 1990 that kind of. Uh, compelled you to move a bit away from Allied Arts and um, you became more involved with the foundation at that point. Oh yeah, well uh, well, by that time I was sick of being an officer and I was sick of going to Allied Arts meetings and and the the thrust was to get rid of the viaduct and uh, and uh, and uh, by that time I was just I just wanted to go to foundation heaven but um, the rule at that time was you had to have been president of Allied Arts to go into the foundation. 
Subsequently, now there's just all sorts of people. But I think it was Mary that made the case that because I had actually for one whole year when this one person who was president never showed up, she said, you know, Ray is as good as president. <laughs> so I went on to the foundation, Foundation Heaven, which was, which I've liked. I've liked the foundation. It didn't have the immediate excitement of the other old allies, but the current allied ours didn't have that kind of excitement either. It was more, well, I don't know exactly what to say. I mean, it was a little more abrasive and anyway, I wasn't very interested in it anymore. You had already been there for a good 18 years. Too long. Yeah. yeah, right, right. Have you been with the foundation ever since? Yes. Don't ask me how long. I have no idea. <laughs> 10 years, 12 years, something like that. And I, uh, the foundation, one of the things that's so much, so much fun about the, no, you can't have that cat. You may not take that cat home with you. I'm putting her in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that's wonderful about being on the foundation is giving money away. I love going over the applications. They're so heartfelt and they're so meaningful. And you know that these people are competing for like little salted peanuts, you know. I mean, we never give away more than a thousand, maybe a little bit more, but most of them are in the realm of 350, 500. And these really moving uh, requests for money. So I really like being on the foundation, but I like being on Allied Arts at a certain time. And then after a while, I thought, oh my God, been there, done that. Did it seem at that point also that, that the organization itself was maybe losing some effectiveness? Yes. I think it lost a lot of credibility. It, in my mind, and I don't know that this is true, maybe it was just my mind, which is they were no longer a major player. And during the other periods, they were a player, Allied Arts of Seattle. You know, the city council would say, what does Allied Arts think about this? And I don't recall that that happened later on. So. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your, the work that you did outside of Allied Arts. And um, you were as you, you, you mentioned, a, a senior planner for the Department of Parks and Recreation. As head of planning. The head of planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, also a faculty member at the UW and mm -hmm. also the, the critic for architecture and, um, and design for the Seattle Times. And i um, wondering if you could, if you could uh, expand on those a little bit and tell us a little bit about those experiences in the Parks Department. And sure. In the Parks Department, um, Planning for we had a lot of money because there were bond issues and so Part of my role was to get them started get the planning done and and there were several ones Discovery Park for example was one and um, That I worked on a lot and obviously the Arboretum um, the Visitor Center um, It, it didn't always go smoothly and one of the things I used to tell my class about citizen participation which I absolutely believe in and citizens should come out and say but I would also say to them that you know they were going to be planners and they were going to have to learn to listen but I would say that um, nothing dulls your enthusiasm for a citizen participation, like participating with citizens. Because, you know, I can't tell you the number of nights that I would be at a council hearing or at a community center and just be yelled at and abused. Abused. So, um, but I enjoyed it still. The, um, Teaching was really my fort. I loved it. Uh, but I was never on tenure track, so I was always dependent on one of my colleagues leaving.
and I would fill in. But I nonetheless enjoyed it tremendous. I loved teaching. And, um, and then when I was offered, uh, there were three of us that were architectural and design critics, and we rotated on Sunday, you know, every other third Sunday. And, uh, and I loved that too. I loved them when the articles when they were done. I mean, writing is very easy for me. Um, but getting started writing is not so easy. Anyway, basically it ruined a weekend to do those. But it sent me out to, you know, lots of different places to figure out what I was going to write about and so on and so forth. So, and now I have 98 articles, so faded now. So, actually, I've liked all of the work I've done, I think. Did you choose the, you chose the subjects that you wrote about? Oh, for the Seattle Times? Oh, yes, absolutely. Do you want to know my favorite one that I wrote? It was on graveyards. Oh, you know, please talk about that. It was on, um, well, I am what is known as a necropophile. And <laughs> um, so I wrote a, a, a long article on Lakeview Cemetery, but I expanded it to include cemeteries in general. And I think what I was, my theme was that they are microcosms of cities. If you go, if you go to Lakeview, you know, the poor people are on the fringes and the rich people are on the hill and there is segregation. The Chinese are here, the Japanese are here, the immigrants are way over there. And the importance of people is judged by the how big their monuments are, their tombstones, the boulevards, the things that go around the more opulent areas are wider than the other areas. So I had a lot of fun, you know, pushing that metaphor. It's very interesting. It was a lot of fun. And very true. And very true. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that, that I remember very vividly was the uh, going to a cemetery in New York and um, there were a lot of jazz, a lot of jazz greats buried at the cemetery. Uh, many of them had very big um, mausoleums or markings, and, markings and, tombstones. And, um, then there were a couple that fell on hard times at the end of their careers and kind of faded away, and they were sort of on the fringes. So the ones that kind of died popular were really, really prominent. The ones that died not so popular were kind of shoved to the side. It was very interesting. Well, I think if you wander around in Lakeview, you would see similar things. One of the other little things that I <clears throat> noticed in Lakeview and other places, um, but Lakeview particularly, is that who the person that predeceases doesn't get to write their epitaph. And so the one that struck me the most was a husband and wife, and he had predeceased her. And she wrote on for his epitaph, uh, he was faithful to the end. I wonder, you know, I can't remember what she wrote for herself, but anyway, yeah, that was one of my favorite ones. And then I think probably uh, the other one that I like, well, actually, I think it's very immodest of me to say, but once I wrote something and refined it, I kind of liked most of them, you know. Several of them have been published, so and so. I mean, besides in the paper, they've been picked up. So. Are there are there any places that you wrote about that you are particularly fond of in terms of buildings, um, in terms of design in Seattle? Sure. I wrote about Fred's federal building. Yeah, um, didn't get a chance to write about the EMP, which would have been fun because I think it's horrible. <laughs> Big thumbs down. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to just kind of scroll through. I'll come back to that, but yeah, just a mostly I wrote about sculpture, art. I mean, so it wasn't so much buildings, 
but I wrote about leftover statues, you know, generals on horses, the Seward statue that was in uh, Volunteer Park that's now been moved down to Seward. I wrote about the um, things on buildings, paintings, and things like that. So less that than real architecture, okay? In general, um, outside of even what you might have written about, do you have some favorites in Seattle at this point, some favorite buildings or favorite designs that, um, that you wouldn't mind sharing? Well, Seattle changes so fast, you know, it's sort of like something that I really like is gone, you know, uh, now. Um, but I think um, one of my favorite buildings, and I don't even know what it is, is at, it's a triangular building, more or less. It's um, between Denny Wang and um, Boyer, or what? Well, on um, between third and fourth, and it's it's cantilevered so that the sun um, is protected in the from all ways. It's really kind of a remarkable building. It's it's like a layer cake. It's it's wonderfully constructed, and I don't know who the architect is, but I've looked at that building a lot, and a lot of people don't see it. But when I mention it to an architect, they say, oh, "Yeah, that is a really great building. It's a fine little building." So, what was it about Fred's Federal Building that you really liked? The roof. The roof. Um, it's too bad that it's you know the the uh, facade, uh, the skin, um, looks like Bisquick, and but that isn't what he had in you know he had envisioned it would be brick and it would have been wonderful, but the GS day just so that it looked like. But Fred's roof, you look at it and you think, aha, there is a mind behind this. You know, many of the buildings downtown, it's like the Jolly Green Giant came and just went whack, you know. But that building is wonderful. It's almost like a sculpture. So, yes, I like that. We're gonna, we might need another tape. But, well, I've got okay. another one. But we have two minutes for this tape, and then we're going to switch to another tape. But it will only be no. a, sh a shorty. A shorty. <laughs> um, just a couple of, just a couple of uh, comments about. Again, we'll stay, stick to stick to your your work at this point. Um, you've you've done some reports and some books that have been published, and uh, I've never had a book published. Uh, there's, they're kind of, I guess, they're bound reports. That, mm, okay. Um, <laughs> Do you, do you remember, I mean, there was one study that you did of redlining, which was... Oh, yes, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could, you, could you talk a little bit about some of those things that you worked on? Oh, I, you know, I don't really remember that. I mean, it's a long time ago, and I was very involved in a time when redlining is long gone. Um, those are... Yeah, I did a lot of those, that's true. I, did, I guess I have more of a bibliography than I think I do, so... Yeah, they're at the U, actually. They're, they're just cataloged and available. <laughs> well, the answer is no. I don't remember. <laughs> I wrote a lot. You worked for the Department of Justice as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, what, what did you do there? Well, um, that was um, <laughs> my former boss, Dave Town, who had been the superintendent of parks. Um, uh, had a contract with the Department of Justice, and he needed someone to do the planning part of it. So he hired me on contract. And it was, it was really an interesting project. It was about, in Idaho, Hayden Lake, and it was about the misappropriation of what was supposed to be public land. And it turned out that most of the land was sort of illegally owned by state senators and people in the legislature of Idaho. So I went through all that and did that. That was really kind of fun. And then Dave testified to it. 